vascular surgeons and uh, and geology, radiology doctors all over the universe. I'm honored to welcome you to the 11th uh, webinar meeting titled uh, there's a, a uh, there is an aneurysm and I want to fix it. Uh, in the beginning, uh, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Omar Farou. Hello, Omar. Hello, Professor Ayman. Uh, and uh, I will introduce my dear speakers, eminent speakers, Professor Armando Lobato from Brazil, Professor Samar Kosair from Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, Professor Murad Salam from United Kingdom. And we have a great panel too. Uh, let me uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Din Hussein from Egypt. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Hassan Rabia from United Kingdom, uh, Professor Rassam Osman from Saudi Arabia, uh, and uh, still waiting for Professor Atif Salam from the United States, and uh, Nicola Trossi from Italy. Uh, now uh, we are going to start uh, the program. Please, I will introduce in a few words. I believe ne ne Nicola is around. Uh, he's a, a consultant of vascular surgery uh, and the medical director of Sao Paulo Vascular and Endovascular Surgery Institute. Uh, he's a national and international speaker uh, in many countries and conferences all over the world. Uh, today he is going to discuss comparison and the results of endovascular repair techniques in award by iliac aneurysms. Thank you and please uh, you can start, uh, Professor Armando. Thank you, Professor Ayman. It's a great pleasure to be with you and to share our studies that you have done the last 20 years regarding these uh, techniques to treat uh, bilateral pulmonary artery injuries. So you can see the, the image there? Yes. You can? Good. Good. So, uh, we're going to talk regarding the comparison and result of endovascular repair techniques in elective bilateral arteriac aneurysms. So, okay. Okay. I have no disclosure uh, for this talk. What about the background? So, so endovascular abdominal aneurysm repair is evolved as a feasible, less invasive alternative to open repair. Limiting of the long-term complications specific to EVAR is a challenge to interventionists. Up to 30% of patients with AAA due to concomitant iliac artery aneurysm disease are unfit for standard EVAR. Despite the improvement and the vascular techniques, one aspect of aneurysmal disease that continues to be challenging is the management of the common iliac artery aneurysms. Poor patients or stent graft selections undermines the effectiveness of EVAR. Most studies report the outcome of EVAR in patients with adverse morphological features at the proximal seal include the neck angulation, diameter, and thrombosis. Was operative artery modeling following successful sac exclusion and the late progression of aneurysmal degeneration may predispose to late endolinks. Like the proximal lane zone, a durable distal seal is essential for uh, long-term follow-up and results. There are conflicting results on whether concomitant ectasia or cumuliac after aneurysm limits full exclusion of the aneurysm and increase the complexity of EVAR. The, true, the, sorry, the three most commonly performed procedure are internal iliac embolization or occlusion with extension of the stent graft to the sternal iliac extension, 
internal iliac endovascularization and can be uh, do by branch graft or sandwich technique, a parallel grafts, and flare limbs or bell bottle technique to the comiliac artery and rhythm preserving the hypogastric artery. The bell bottle technique is also associated with complications such as type 1 B endolics and iliac limb migration in the literature as was from 3.4 to 7 percent. Belbot technique has a higher incidence of reintervention in the follow-up period up to 14 percent. Sacrifice the hypogastric artery for effective treatment is not a doubt sequel, which may include botocal education, colonic ischemia, spinal cord ischemia, as well as botox and scrotal necrosis and new onset of erectile dysfunction. So our students from January 2000 to December 2019, 122 patients with asymptomatic AAA, mean size 56 millimeters, associate with bilateral common iliac artery aneurysm. Underwent elective, not urgent, only elective EVAR at our institution. It's very important to, to make sure that only patient with bilateral common iliac artery aneurysm associated. So a total of 244 common iliac artery aneurysm were treated using either the same technique bilaterally or a different technique in each side. For these 122 patients, nine procedures were bilateral bell bot technique, 47 patients were underwent a bilateral coil embolization, hypogastric artery, Six patients were underwent a bilateral sandwich technique. 27 patients were combined between unilateral sandwich technique and the other side, the contralateral uh, coil embolization. 13 patients were uh, underwent a unilateral sandwich technique and other side by bell bottle technique. And the last 20 patients where underwent unilateral core embolization for the hypogastric artery combined with contralateral bell bottom technique. How did the technique that you use in this study? That is a, a, it was a retrospective study. First, we, by contralateral uh, groin access, we get by a uh, uh, catheter and cut cannulated uh, a hypogastric artery and used in the main trunk uh, at least three coils. We wait one, to, one week to 10 days, seven days to 10 days, and we, the patient come back to the OR, and in this moment, we do the same thing in the contralateral hypogastric artery. And after other seven days, so now from the beginning, from type zero until two, two weeks, we deploy the bifurcated stent graft. We've, we start this in 2000 until 2008, because in 2008, we start to have, uh, I start to use a sandwich technique and avoid to do a bilateral hypogastric occlusion in that moment. So this technique was done between 2000 and 2008. And we follow the Frank Witt recommendation about the sequential embolization and delivery the stent graft. Witt's recommendation in, 2000, in 1999 is to use an interval between one week, between one to other core embolization, hypogastric artery, and one week or two, 10 days to deploy 
the main body of the, the, the stent graft. So after two weeks from the first embolization, we do uh, 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 in the luminograft uh, deployment, as you can see in that picture. So the iliac extension uh, fixed in the stern iliac artery. The bell ball technique was um, a little bit more simple, but it's very important to, uh, uh, to understand that you need to have at least three centimeters to fix that uh, the flare, as you can see that, the bell bottle inside the cumuliac artery. So you're doing the, in this, uh, of, uh, of course, in the same time is a, a more easier procedure. What about the sandwich technique? The sandwich technique, we start to deploy a stent graft just below the renal artery as this, all the, 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 the techniques. And we land the distal end of the iliac limb as close as possible to the hypogastric artery. Because if I close too far, I will need a self expandable cover stent longer. So that's why the best way is to deploy, to have to be a very good measurement, preoperative, to, uh, to take the right uh, stent graft for uh, this situation. So when I deploy the main body of the stent graft, uh, would be uh, all kinds, uh, 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 bimodular, trimodular, doesn't matter. I came for the left brachial artery with uh, a long introducer. It's uh, almost seven French, 90 centimeters long. And inside that, a uh, vertebral catheter, 125 centimeters long. And I can the hypogastric artery with the teromo stiff Y. After I cannulated the hypogastric artery, I go further with the uh, vertebral catheter to exchange the teromo stiff wire by a super stiff wire like amplats with one or no more than two centimeters chip long, long chip. So now I have the the hypogastric cannulated from the brachial and I have the main body deployed. The next step, I came from the femoral approach and use a contralateral limp, contralateral iliac limp, and from the brachial, a self expandable cover stand. In the majority of the case, I use a viaban. The very important step now is we need to have five centimeters here overlapping between this self expandable cover stent and here the iliac uh, extension. So it means that the vaban will be at least 10 centimeters long as you need five centimeters to overlap it. So we we'll want to lose five centimeters. So we need one more centimeters above, to be above the iliac extension to avoid occlusion of the viaba. So you lose, we lose six centimeters of viaba. And the last four is get to be inside the hypogastric artery. And regarding the uh, iliac limb extension, the majority of the case, you need a 10 centimeters long iliac limb. And as you know, all the contralateral limb, iliac contralateral limb are a dock system. So the proximal diameter is always the same, depends of the, your choice graft. I have no choice. You can have anyone that you, I, know, I have no preference of graft. So your, your uh, extension of your iliac extension will be at least 10 centimeters long, as you know, we need the five centimeters for overlapping to avoid gutters and endolite, and the other five centimeters to get inside the iliac, sternal iliac artery. And the diameter of the sternal iliac, the, the iliac extension 
will be one or two millimeters bigger than the standard iliac diameter. For example, if the standard iliac diameter is eight millimeters, I use a iliac length of 10 millimeters. And regarding the same for Viaba, if Viaba is the hypogastric artery has five millimeters, my Viaba will have six millimeters. So that's the, 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 the sizing. So after that, I have a uh, position, the sternal iliac extension and the uh, viable or self spondable cover stench inside the arteries. First, I deploy the iliac limb extension and keep the viable undeployed. After deployed with these five centimeters overlapping, I use a latex balloon to accommodate this iliac extension uh, through the viaba. The viaba will be in the middle between the first iliac limb and this, the second one that I just, uh, I just uh, delivered. This, this, this maneuver is to avoid gutters between the viaba and the two iliac uh, limbs. So after you use a latex balloon, I will deploy the viaba. And for the contralateral limb, I will do exactly the same steps that I did for the first side. So this is the sandwich technique that I use in this study. And what kind of techniques you use? We use all the six techniques for, as I told before, I could use one side sandwich technique and bell bottom technique, or I can use a core embolization in one side and bell bottom technique for the other side. I could use bilateral sandwich technique, or I can use a, a, a sandwich on one side and core embolization for the other side. And here you see the core embolization bilaterally and the stent graft go through the external iliac artery bilaterally. And finally, we can you use a bilateral bell bottom technique. This was the sixth uh, option of treatment for this bilateral common iliac aneurysm associated with abdominal aortic aneurysm in this study. So we divide this and risks in three groups. One group, group one, is uh, regarding the coil embolization, uh, the uh, hypogastric artery endovascularization by sandwich technique. So we treat 52 hypogastric arteries with that technique. In group two, we use a hypogastric artery occlusion by call you embolization in 141 hypogastric arteries. And we keep hypogastric patency by bell bottle technique in 51 hypogastric iliac arteries. So this total is 244 iliacs uh, treated. Regarding the, 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 the characteristics of the, the, the groups, by uh, crux wallis we didn't find any difference of these three groups. However, you see, as you can see in the red line, the more patients with cardiac disease and coronary artery disease were present in the bell bottom group. However, with no statistical difference. Regarding diameters, we found that the comiliac artery, both sides, right or left, and the hypogastric artery, right or left, were in minor diameters. Yeah, they were smaller than the uh, uh, iliac arteries from the uh, uh, coil embolization sandwich technique. Why? Because you can use only iliac arteries until 
24 millimeters to use a bell bottom technique. So that's uh, uh, one of the difference. You cannot use more than 24 millimeters in uh, iliac, common iliac arteries in that moment in the study. Regarding um, these three groups, uh, the, by Cox regression, multivariate analysis, we found first the follow up, of course, were uh, smaller. In the sandwich group, it's a 39.3 months of follow up. When you compare with hypogastric after occlusion or bell ball technique, why? Because uh, we start to use sandwich technique in 2008. In this uh, study, it starts in 2000. So in 2000, we use our bell button or uh, core embolization. And after 2008, you start to use um, uh, sandwich technique. So the follow up is, is smaller in that group. Or uh, the, 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 the more important point that you, we found by this Cox regressions multivariate analysis. We found in the hypogastric artery occlusion where statistically significant early related mortality, early botocic claudication, and late endolic type 2, all were statistically very significant when you compare with that. This is one patient that I treat with, uh, with uh, a coibolization as I described before in this technique. This is a bilateral comuniacal aneurysm, bilateral hypogastric artery aneurysm. And then first time we use a coibolization in the trunk of the hypogastric artery always after uh, we perform that in that moment, we use a, a retrosigmoidoscopy uh, before the discharge patient to see if the retrosigmoid is clear. After 10 days, we coil, you can see here the previous coil here, and now we coil the right side of the hypogastric artery before the charge. We have the red sigmoidoscopy. It's very clear, very. But the patient starts to have, a, 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 before to deploy the main body, actually it was on Sunday, it was programmed to perform the EVAR in this patient on Tuesday. The patient starts to have a fever and back pain. So we did a red sigmoidoscopy and it was completely normal because I thought could be a, 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 a colon ischemia. However, the patient was completely clear. So we did a, a, a tomography, a CAT scan. You see uh, the image here from the, 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 comular, the hypogastric artery, like a, a, a onion, uh, expert, very, uh, a lot of uh, uh, chambers. And this patient actually, uh, we, we prepared to, to perform that procedure in the, on Sunday morning. However, the patient ruptured and died before in, in, the, in the midnight. The other complication that we found in bilateral coimbolization was a type two endoleak, late type two endoleak, not near, no early, but late. We did not find any correlation between, uh, between the late type 2 endoleak and aneurysm site increasing, not yet. But we found a more type 2 endoleak, late type 2 endoleaks. With what we found in this Cox regression multivariate analysis regarding the bell bottom group, we found late related mortality, aneurysm rupture more frequently than the other two groups, as well iliac limb migration and late, late endoleak type 1D. All these four complications were 
statistically significant. This one patient that was used a zenith stent graft with bilateral bell bottom technique. In this patient has all kinds of complication. This patient has a, a disconnection of the contralateral limb in type three endoleak. He got a, a migration, total migration of the bell, of the bell bottom here and type 1B endoleak, and this patient uh, got rupture and he died before go to the OR. The other complication is could be the same. We, we treated this patient in the, uh, at, uh, I think it was three at morning, the same complication, you got a bell bottom uh, migration rupture of the aneurysm, and we fix it with uh, uh, iliacal limb extension to the stand iliac artery and save the life of this patient. The other complication, as I mentioned before, is uh, iliacal limb migration. So this is uh, uh, endurance to stent graft in the distal uh, bell bottom is 25 millimeters in diameters. It was done in 2011, March. September 11, you can see, start to have a migration between the first deployment and the first tomography and the second angiotomography. In August 12, you see more than two centimeters of distal migration. The more important to pay attention, the aneurysm was completely excluded and is shrinking. So you can see it's the same position of the image. You see how it's going. He's kinking. And that's why you have this shrinking aneurysm size. The uh, endograph starts to kinking and push up the elite limb to uh, push the leak lip to up. So you got a, uh, it did not have endoleak here, just migration. But when I found this, I just uh, used a, a sandwich technique to uh, preserve the hypogastric artery as the left, uh, the right hypogastric artery was coiled in the first procedure. So I went to save that hypogastric artery in this patient. And we did a study comparing bilateral coil embolization against unilateral coil embolization. And take a look, all these complications by Cox regression, multivariate analysis show a statistical difference between early type one a and the leak, late related mortality, early type 2 and the leak, late type 2 and the leak, early botox claudication, a permanent botox claudication. So it, it's very clear in that study that uh, bilateral hypogastric artery occlusion is worse than unilateral hypogastric occlusion. And also, we did a comparison between bell bot technique when you use uh, a iliac limb with the distal diameter bigger than 20 millimeters in comparison with bell bottle equal or, or less than 20 millimeters. We found by Cox regression, multivariate analyze that late relate mortality, late type 1B endoleak, late aneurysm rupture and iliac limb migration were statistically higher in the group that use, we use a bell ball technique bigger than 20 millimeters in diameter. Now you got a, a Kaplan-Meier uh, graphic and you see regarding the type 2 endoleaks, you see after 
125 months, the hypogastric artery uh, starts to have uh, less patients free from type 2 endoleak. So the incidence of late type 2 endoleak is higher in that group after 125 minutes. Regarding now the type 1B endoleak, you see the bell bottom technique also starts in 100 months, oh, sorry, in, in the, uh, uh, yes, in the 100 months, it starts to get worse regarding uh, the type 1B endoleak when you compare with the other technique by Kamplemeyer graphic. Lately, in the luminal graft migration in the bell bottle technique, you see after 75 months starts to get worse and get more iliac limb migration. This is a iliac limb, not proximal migration. I'm talking about iliac uh, distal migration from the, the hypogastric artery. Regarding the later rupture, regarding, uh, you see the bell bottom group after the same 90 months of follow-up by Kaplan-Meier starts to have significant more later rupture when you compare with the other two groups. And late related mortality as well for the bell bottom group, you see statistically very high significance, starting 75 months to have much more late related mortality in that group. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom technique can be used in a safe way when you have a orthodontic aneurysm with comuniac after aneurysm less than 20 millimeters. Try to not use a bell bottom uh, iliac limb more than 22 millimeters in diameter. The only exception to use the bell bottom in bigger iliac comuniac after aneurysm is when the patient has a uh, 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 few years of life, the prognosis of that patient. So it's a very sick patient. So probably could use the sandwich like 20, oh, the bell ball technique in 27, 28 millimeters in diameter, but only in very, very sick patient. And you can start a discussion if you should or not treat that patient. But it's a very health patient just use your bell bottle with comuniac artery aneurysm less than 20 millimeters. Bilateral hypogastric artery occlusion should be avoided due to significant high early mortality rate and other complications, as I showed before. Unilateral hypogastric artery occlusion can be used in severe, severe hypogastric artery stenosis and or very poor runoff. Or when you have a hypogastric artery trunk less than four millimeters in diameter. And very important, celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, and deep femoral artery must to be patents. So this technique should be used in cumulative artery bigger, equal or bigger than 20 millimeters. And more important with the hypogastric trunk must to have at least four millimeters in diameter, and the hypogastric must to have a very good runoff. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lupato. It was a very nice presentation, and thank you for keeping the, the time. Uh, I think we'll have uh, some questions and discussion. Uh, but uh, let me start. Uh, at the, uh, I see uh, you have many cases of permanent uh, uh, qualification. Uh, I think uh, there will be some discussion about that, but let us start by uh, uh, talking to Professor Antoniani. He is going to make an announcement, then we will go to the discussion after uh, Dr. Antoniani. Are you ready to show your uh, slide, uh, Dr. Antoniani? Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm ready. 
go screen. Show the, the slide. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for the opportunity to present the first virtual congress of the International Union of Angiology. The, we put online the congress just next Monday. So I ask to our friend Ivan to present this to, to announce, excuse me, but there is a little problem. You see the, the screen? Yes, we saw the screen. Ah, okay, but I don't know why I don't have the screen. Okay, well, no problem. Okay, so. Uh, this is uh, some data about the Congress. We are 30 participating societies, 40 symposia, 16 lectures, 186 presentation, 66 select the oral communication, especially the special group is from young member of our IUA committee. 57 selected poster and more than 250 speakers. In total, the Congress corresponded to full four days of normal Congress. This is the list of a participating society. It is also your society. The abstract, received abstract uh, has been published as a supplement online of International Angiology. It is a, a document uh, will be uh, on the website during the next week. At the moment, uh, more than 600 registered delegates is present, are present. And uh, of course, we go online uh, 15 of June for three months. So it's possible to register during this period. And uh, during the Congress, uh, we will activate some chat with the question to speakers and answer from them. And some particular dedicated webinars on uh, some special uh, topics. It's possible from the 15th of June to register to the Congress and by means of the website. All speakers uh, will have the free access to Congress. It is, a, it is a mandatory to thank all executive administrative board of IUA, in particular the scientific committee, all participating society, all speakers, especially because they work hardly during this particular moment with the pandemic. The Secretariat of IUA and the Organizative Secretariat, Union Event, the our secret, Italian Secretariat, and of course the sponsors with the, uh, their support. So I invite all of you to register to the Congress to this very important uh, true vascular forum without borders. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Antoniani, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, it was a great honor for us. And now back to the discussion. Uh, I was asking about the permanent qualification and uh, I think there will be some discussion about that. Let us start by Professor Troasi from Italy. Uh, what do you think about uh, the bilateral coil embolization of the hypogastric artery? Do you think it is a safe procedure? First of all, good evening to everyone. And uh, thanks uh, a lot for the kind invitation. Uh, mm, congratulations to Professor Lobato for the excellent presentation. Uh, about your question, uh, in our daily clinical practice, we uh, avoid the bilateral embolization of hypogastric arteries. Uh, so just in case uh, uh, with bilateral common iliac artery aneurysm, so involving the ostea, ostea of uh, hypogastric arteries, we prefer to guarantee 
the flow to preserve the flow uh, of at least one ecogastric artery. So it's necessary with a branched graft uh, or with other techniques, uh, we don't use the sandwich technique technique presented by Professor Lobato, but usually we avoid the bilateral embolization of hypogastric arteries. Uh, thank you, Professor Trossi. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Rabia, what do you think about uh, gut uh, vasculature and uh, uh, preservation of the gut circulation uh, in using these techniques? Yeah, thank you again for this uh, nice opportunity to be with my colleagues and my masters. Uh, actually, in the practice in UK, in our center, we are using the IBE, the, the gold device, and we the and in general we we avoid the embolization of the internal iliac and hypogastric arteries nowadays, unless it is mandatory, and if there is. Uh, associated uh, mesenteric stenosis or occlusion in the other uh, three vessels uh, of the mesenteric and celiac at least, uh, this may be contraindicated to go for that. So we have a, a big concern in UK regarding embolizing hypogastric unless we must do, actually. So uh, I enjoyed actually the, the presentation and the large number and the follow-up and actually the long-term follow-up for, for, for the presentation, uh, Professor Armando. Uh, but as I said, we, we actually uh, are not doing any more the hypogastric immunization in our cases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rabia. Uh, Dr. Esam Osman from Saudi Arabia, welcome on board. Uh, I think you have some comments uh, and uh, questions for uh, Dr. Lobato. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much, and uh, hello to all my friends and uh, colleagues. Um, and thank you, Professor, for a, a very uh, comprehensive presentation. Like my colleagues have said, it's a very large number, and you have a very long follow-up, so it's very informative in that respect. Um, I have uh, two questions and a comment. First, the comment is I think the, the branched iliac prosthesis is now probably uh, going to change a lot of uh, our approaches to to these these patients, um, and I wonder whether you're using that now instead of some of your techniques described. And in particular, um, I I'm still a very strong proponent of open surgery. So so I'm interested to understand when you said those patients who are unfit, and did you have a standardized assessment of fitness, and how did you assess fitness? And the last thing is, uh, do you have any data on erectile dysfunction between the two, the three techniques? I think that would be very informative as well. Thank you. There are comments now? Yes, sure, please. Okay, yes. good, good. Very, very nice uh, comments. I appreciate that. Very interesting about that. First of all, I, I give you back actually the, the question. And uh, regarding the IBE, uh, we do have IBE in Brazil, IBD also. And uh, if you use an IFU of that graft, you cannot treat no more than 40% of your patient, 40, 40. Yeah. So remind 60% of your patient, you need to do something of that. So that's why, uh, I think this parallel technique in, in this moment is to have a rules in the treatment of this kind of aortiliac aneurysms. I think the, the bifoc iliac bifurcated stent graft should get better for the next future. So you can get more than 40%. And if you get out of the IFU, uh, like uh, 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 some paper from Germany, uh, Colonia, my friends, uh, you get no more than 60%. So you are out of IFU of the bifurcated stent graft. Idiot. So you cannot get more than 6% of the, the patient treat with this uh, iliac uh, uh, branch uh, technique. First question. The second question is, when you have, uh, I, 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 I'm a vascular surgeon also, 
and I perform uh, uh, open repair, of course. In, uh, in my center is 30%. But if you pay attention about that, uh, the majority of the patients had bilateral cumuliac artery aneurysm involving the hypogastric artery. And when you have some uh, in, this, in this group, 60% of the patient has the hypogastric aneurysmatic one. So probably you know how difficult it is in the open repair to fix the hypogastric in the very deep parts of the pelvis of that patient. So when you uh, have these huge aneurysms uh, and we have uh, a possibility uh, in that moment to use, uh, you see in the diameter, medium diameter of the cumuliac after aneurysm in that group was 4.5 millimeters in diameter, a huge cumuliac aneurysm. Uh, the exception was for the, the bell bottom technique. The bell bottom technique, the aneurysm was very short, but as I show in the, in the, in the demographic uh, table, they have more heart and coronary disease and heart disease. For that patient, the cardiologist uh, recommended to use an endovascular procedure. So one of the parts of fit was because the anatomical difficulties to open repair. And the other that have no anatomical difficulties to open repair was because the cardiologists sell this patients unfit and they use in that patient a bell bot technique. And as a, um, a very important to, to talk about the, the uh, coil embolization, I think uh, now uh, it's, it's, it's mandatory to at least keep one hypogastric artery uh, open. However, uh, I, we use also iliac branch graft. But as the same I show for the, the sandwich technique, if you have a, 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 a hypogastric trunk less than four millimeters in diameter, don't try to use a bifurcated branch graft or a sandwich technique. Your, graft, your technique will fail. It will close because it's too, too small. You need to have at least four millimeters in diameter upper sandwich or for uh, uh, IBE techniques. So that's the only situation that I think the coembolization keep on when you have, as I show in my last, is last template, when you have a very small uh, hypogastric artery trunk, less than four, three, or you have a very poor runoff, don't try to use a uh, iliac branch or a sandwich when your hypogastric has a very poor runoff because your branch or your sandwich will be included in the follow-up. That's I have this complication. Thank you. Yes, you have a point, Seth. I agree for that. Before uh, I leave the mic to Omar, uh, I think uh, let's have a comment, uh, quick comment from uh, uh, Professor Ahmed Hussain, then you can take uh, the mic over, Omar. Dr. Ahmed, please. Open, open the mic, Dr. Ahmed. Yes, thank you. I enjoyed the presentation by Professor Armando and uh, I have um, uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first one is concerning uh, the healthcare system uh, in Brazil. Um, Obviously, um, with such large number of, uh, of uh, patients requiring different uh, techniques, uh, that entails uh, probably a, a lot of equipment and uh, devices that you have either um, on shelf or uh, in some other uh, easy modality to acquire or purchase them. And the second question um, uh, concerning um, the uh, sub group of patients who developed more complications, especially the coronary artery disease and the ischemic heart disease in general. Um, and I would relate that, uh, of course, and I would like to engage also uh, other distinguished panelists. 
with the uh, with the the get fit triple A trial uh, by Manchester University recently, um, those patients who uh, were uh, between uh, aneurysm diameter more than three and less than five, uh, so we're talking about patients who might or might not be in need of intervention, whether EVAR or open later on, if they are given the opportunity to have certain community-based uh, physical exercise or even home-based, that would uh, improve their oxygen saturation and then uh, they would be less vulnerable at the time of intervention uh, if ever deemed necessary. Uh, I would like to have your comment on that also. Thank you. First, okay, health care. Uh, okay, good. Just, uh, I just uh, I forgot your first question. What's the first question, please? The, first the health care system in Brazil, if it covers uh, all the uh, procedures. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, actually, uh, I, I, I work only in the pri private practice. So all these patients is came my own private practice, not public one. However, in Brazil, public medicine, they, they, uh, they afford the stent graft for all patients, not the all hospitals, but for each 4 million people, they have one hospital that we treat that region for 4 million people with endovascular uh, materials, even for thoracic dissection, thoracic abdominal, thoracic abdominal everywhere. So, uh, so you can treat, yes, you can treat uh, this patient in the line, waiting line for that, it's almost uh, uh, in between two to three months. It's not too long but uh, it's less than, uh, more than two months that would be the ideal to treat that, that patient. Regarding the size, that's very important to show that. Uh, my patient was our iliac aneurysm. So the, uh, the, minimal, the medium diameter of the aneurysm in my group was 5.7 centimeters in diameter, the abdominal aneurysm. And the uh, iliac aneurysm is four, I think 4.2, I can see that 4.2 or 4.3 millimeters regarding the common iliac aneurysm. If I take out the bell, the bell bottom group, that bell bottom group, the aneurysm medium size was between 19 to 20 millimeters in diameter because the biggest in that moment, bell bottom was 24, only in the last, uh, eight years, you have the 27, 28 millimeters bell bottom. So if you got it uh, out of this group, the majority of the patient has more than 4.5 millimeters in diameter. But regarding the mortality, for example, the group that have more uh, heart disease and coronary artery disease was the group of the bell bottom technique. And the bell bottom technique did not show higher mortality. Uh, the, uh, the group that has more early higher mortality was the uh, uh, hypogastric occlusion embolization. So the heart and the coronary disease didn't affect the results because the early mortality was related with the co-embolization and not with the bell bottom technique. Right. Thank you. I answer uh, your question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and, uh, over Omar. Okay. Uh, Professor Samar Kusayir, it's a great privilege to have you with us. Do you like to have a comment or a question to Professor Labat? Uh, thank you, Omar. Uh, of you course, I have many questions, but I don't think we have a time. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Labat. It's a beautiful and excellent lecture, really. Uh, I have one technical question, is that when you use a bivalent in the internal iliac artery, do you put a uh, uh, set expandable stent inside to force it, is the main question. And second thing, how do you decide? Because even sometimes calling one internal iliac artery could be dangerous and cause impotence. So if you have two internal iliac artery, do you try, and both are fit, do you try to save both or just call one and try to save the other? Thank you. Excellent. Very, very good question, Professor Summer. Uh, very interesting about that. So, um, uh, regarding the the uh, you ask the, the first the one, 
Yeah, the first for the yeah, viable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I do not use uh, a stent inside the viable. I use the stent inside the viable when I go to the renal arteries. But I have a very interesting point about that. So I got uh, three renal occlusions, three renal occlusion when I use in the beginning, always a, a self expandable stent inside the viable, outside the viable, inside the renal lumen. And in that point, exactly uh, the, the point that the, the, the stent graft is getting out of the viable, I got a fracture of the self expandable stent and this patient had a renal occlusion. Three patients, I have that. So for renal artery, with the sandwich technique, I still using a uh, self expandable stent. However, no go further the, 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 the limit of the viable. So I finish the self expandable stent exactly when the viable finish. So that's my, my modification of the technique. But for the hypogastric artery, it's uh, uh, the, uh, the only difference is now uh, I use um, uh, angio CT uh, intraoperatively, so you get the round image of the of the 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 robotic uh, machine. If I got more than sixty percent of compression of the viable, because you, I, I I I need the viable be compression at least. 5, 50 or 60 uh, open and 40 until 50% of compression. Middle of that would be compression. But if I have more than 60% of compression, I use a self expandable stent inside. Very rare situation of that. Actually, I did, I, I started to do that because I, I have one patient, the patient was a father of my a physician, uh, urologist. And uh, I did the procedure, looks very well. Um, uh, angiogram, the, the contrast go very fast. And I feel I have some compression there. I, I did the CAT scan one month after and have a compression more than 60%. However, the flow is very, very fast. So I said, I don't, will not treat this patient. After six months, six months, six months, I did another CAT scan more compression a little bit, like seven to 80%, but it's still doing very well and I didn't fix it. So one year follow up when a patient come back, the hypogastric was occluded with my sandwich technique. So now if I have a compression more than 60%, I use a self expandable cover stent, but in very rare situation. The second question, but uh, uh, covering the both or uh, one or both internal iliac artery, if you have them yeah, both open. Very good. Yeah, always, always, I try to revascularize all the hypogastric arteries, all that. Unless this artery has less than four millimeters in diameter, the trunk of the hypogastric, or the runoff is very bad of that, so I avoid. But always, I try to revascularize as the same for the left, uh, the left subclavian, for example, for the, the dissection, always, always I try to revascularize the left subclavian also. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to welcome Professor Atif Salam joining us from United States. I'm not sure how much he have listened to uh, this great lecture. Do you like to have a comment to Professor Atif or a question to Professor Labado? Uh, I really missed a good part of it, uh, uh, the difference in uh, the hours in terms of six versus seven. So this apparently started earlier than the Venus forums. Uh, however, this is a very important topic. Uh, I'm sure it has been covered by the distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, when the time comes, there may be a few questions uh, that we'd like to raise. Uh, is this the right time? Yes, it's the right time. If you have a question, yes. Uh, unless this has been discussed, unless I'd like to ask uh, the speaker about his experience in terms of penetrated and branched uh, graphs. Uh, what uh, what is his experience regarding gutter leak 
with branched grafts and also the various types of leaves, whether it's type three or differently around the branches. The, uh, the last question would be, what's the long-term patency rate of the branches in, in, with both techniques? Thank you. Thank you, okay, Professor. Professor Labato, do you like to reply? Absolutely. Very interesting questions about that. First of all, I just to comment that the uh, the iliac uh, out iliac aneurysm with the iliac cumuliac after aneurysm, you cannot use a finished rate stent graft. You can use only a branch stent graft for the out iliac aneurysm. It's a little bit different from the the just a renal toric abdominal aneurysm. So we need to talk about the, the, the branch, not the fenestration, only for pr proximal problems. So about the branch, we do have experience. I have experience IBE and IBD in Brazil. But as I mentioned before, uh, if, I, if I use these grafts, these two grafts, actually we do have Yotec stent graft also. I, I did the first Yotec bifurcate iliac graft in Brazil. I have experience with all three. But as I told you, if I get all three together, together to find a patient, it cannot be more than 60%, six zero. So you still have a lot of uh, 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 problems to be solved with this technique. For example, all aortiliac aneurysm with a hypogastric aneurysm associated is completely contraindicated for the iliac branch graft. And the, pe the people that try to do that with the branch stent graft get occlusion also. It's the higher incidence of occlusion of the IBE or IBD is the hypogastric occlusion of that. So uh, when you compare, that's the, a very difficult state because uh, when you compare to comp actually not to compare the sandwich with the with the the branch graft is very hard difficult why because in sixty percent of all my sandwich cases were considered unfit for anatomical issues by the company by Gore or by Cook because they have some uh, anatomicals. Uh, situation that the graft is not uh, uh, not good for that. So it's very hard to compare these two situations because for sandwich you use in the more difficult cases. Uh, you see how many uh, hypogastric aneurysm I treat with the sandwich technique is completely impossible to treat with the, the branch stent graft. Regarding the, the, I think a very good point that you mentioned regarding the endolics. I don't know if you, all of you have uh, experience with the uh, ultrasound with bubbles, uh, the contrast, contrast with bubbles. So this contrast ultrasound, if you do that, you just talk to people from Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic from Rochester. So if you do that for branch graft or standard graft or sandwich graft, we found a lot of type 2 endolic that you did not find in the very good CAT scan. So, but this, this type 2 endolics, or could be for parallel graft, like gutters also, for the gutters, not only type 2, but type 1 for the gutters, you cannot find by the, the, the CAT scan, the angel tomography, you can't find in the contrast ultrasound. The question was, uh, do, you, we, do we uh, 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 make any difference with that? If the aneurysm is still shrinking in the same size? So that was the, the discussion that we did yesterday, actually, with the Mayo Clinic people with uh, Oderich. That's another Brazilian uh, famous guy. And uh, they, in that moment, they say they don't care about these endolic, small endolics found by contrast ultrasound that not cause 
and the risk was in, uh, uh, increasing. So that's the point. But of course, if you find, if you look by the ultra contrast ultrason, you could find uh, gutters and the leaks and from the branch graph, the same stuff. Okay, that's a very good point. The contrast enhanced ultrasound accuracy and uh, that the management depends on the clinical picture. I would like to take the opportunity of Dr. Murad Salam. He's joining us from Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital. Do you like to add a comment or a question, uh, Professor Murad? No, I mean, I, I think all of the uh, aspects has been, uh, has been covered already, all of the main ones. So I don't have anything specific that has not been covered. Excellent, excellent. So for the sake of time, uh, the mic is back to you, Professor Ayman, uh, to move to the next great lecture by our eminent Professor Sam al -Kusay. Thank you, Omar. <coughs> now, uh, I'm honored to introduce uh, my dear uh, Professor uh, Sam al -Kusayr. Professor Sam is head and consultant of vascular surgery division of King Faisal Hospital and uh, research center in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He is associate professor in College of Medicine, uh, King Faisal University, and he is international speaker in many countries in Europe, Africa, and the United States. Uh, professor Samer is going to discuss patient tailored solution for challenging TVAR cases. Uh, please, Dr. Samer, the mic is yours. Thank you. I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Can you see it? Yes, yes we can okay. see it very clearly. Thank you very much. Nice, uh, nice beautiful color the slides is back again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ayman and Dr. Omar for inviting me again to this really nice and exciting meeting. Uh, I'm going to take about today about some challenges. We usually, we see them when we do a T of our cases and give some tips and tricks how we can deal with that. The most challenge is really when we deal with the TVAR, we see it in the sizing, proximal landing zone, distal landing zone, axis vessel, spinal cord schema, and indole. And I'm going to go through each one and get some tips and tricks how we can deal with that. Uh, let's start first with the sizing. When we're dealing with aortic arch or thoracic aneurysm, it's very important because the angulation to know the axial diameter measurement is not recommended. We don't use it. There is a reason why you have to have a software with a central line measurement uh, to get the right uh, sizing of the, your landing zone. If you have an tortuous anatomy, usually we use a maximum diameter. If you have a straight anatomy, we, use, we go with the average diameters. The second most important that when you use the links of the required area you're going to cover, never use a central line because central line will underestimate the links because when you put the T-bar inside the thoracic aorta, it's going to take the outer curve. So you need to move your, light, uh, your line, central line to the outer curve and get the right uh, links of the device you're going to use. The main challenge when you have a type B dissection, <clears throat> then what do you do? Usually when you have a type B dissection, we measure the diameter of the healthy aorta immediately before the dissections. What about the distal landing zone? Because the distal landing zone is collapsed, then you usually use an estimate, but most of the time we use a tapered graft. Third thing, what about the links? How links to how much we need to cover? And this is a very big controversial you know, uh, subject. I can't go over it now, but in general, our practice, we, we try to cover at least the uh, proximal tear. We use at least minimum 200 uh, millimeter links of the device. I will try to cover the, the all aneurysmal part of the dissections. Of course, if you use an IVAS, it would be very helpful in dissection because it gives you more accurate sizing and it also helps you to guide you to be inside the true lumen, not in the false lumen. And again, the most important, we don't oversize type B dissection. We don't go more than 10% oversizing. What about the aneurysm? When you do the aneurysm, we go with more 15 to 20. And even now we go with a 20. We like really to oversize with uh, aneurysms. If you have a transection or trauma, we don't go more than zero to 10%. Of course, if you're going to use a chimney or snorting technique, then we need to go at least 30%. What the problem, if you oversize, then you end with a graft collapse. This is an early really case from I think 2009. 
when patient has a traumatic thoracic aortic transection. And he came and they put TVAR and then they put another one inside it for some reason. And he ended with complete infold of the TVAR. And he's a young guy, 20 years old, and he ended with uh, uh, systemic hypertension. He has to be on three antihypertensive medications. Uh, after many years, we decided to take him and just do below angioplasty. We see if we can unfold the, the stent, the TVAR. It works really, but it only for a couple of years and they has to go back on the antihypertensive medications. And then we have no choice. We took him back to surgery. He's a young guy, 29 years old. We don't want him to live with antihypertensive medications. We put him on, we put him on left heart bypass machine, did open thoracotomy, removed that graft and we, uh, the T-bar and put interposition graft. And he did a great after that. And he's off all his antihypertensive medications. What about the second challenge is the landing zone, proximal landing zone. Of course, all of us, we know our landing zone at the arch. We have zone zero, which involving the origin of the innominate artery. Zone one involving the left, uh, the left common carotid artery. Zone two involving the origin of the left subclavian artery. And zone three, distal to left subclavian artery. <clears throat> How we measure? Again, we use a CTA with central line measurement. We go with the outer to outer diameters, even though some devices with eye view to take it, tell you to go inner to inner, but our practice always we go outer to outer diameters. And the aortic, uh, aorta or the landing zone which we can really land, it should be less than 42 millimeter because the largest device we have is 46. What about the length of the landing zone? The proximal landing zone need at least two centimeter. We cannot compromise that. And this has to be measured from the inner curve, not the central, not the outer curve, because this is what gives you the seal, the inner curve. So you need to have at least two centimeters of the inner curve of the aortic arch. Also, we look at the location of the aortic arch branches. We look at the morphology of the arch. We look at the angulation, calcification, thrombus, and the shape of the uh, aortic arch. But the, the golden rule is the two centimeter. We can compromise with the EVAR, but in the T-bar, you cannot compromise. If you don't get it right from the beginning, you're going to end with more trouble later on if you don't get a good seal. I think the only exception is this uh, paper uh, published in Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2018. The only early exception when you have a blunt thoracic trauma, because in, blood thoracic, in the blunt thoracic trauma, you're not, it's different from the aneurysm. Uh, so they found that if you have a shorter landing zone, 10, 20 millimeter, even five millimeter, proximal, it's okay and safe if you want to keep the left subclavian artery open because the graft in the traumatic thoracic injury work as a bridge to allow healing. It's not like we're looking for a seal. So even if you get some leak around the T-bar, it's still acceptable as, though, as far as you don't have a free ruptures. But again, they left this to the surgeon discretion to decide that because sometimes because the angulation of the arch, you need to cover subclavian. But if you, if you have a short landing zone and you can keep, keep the left subclavian artery open, then it's better to use that. And again, five to 10 millimeters is acceptable in the traumatic thoracic injury. The second thing is that when you land in the aortic arch, it's very important to land when you have a severe angulation to look at the area between the stent. And you need this, this area to be at the curve because if you land your stent, here, which is a uh, stiff part of the stent at the curve, then you're going to have a bird beak, sorry. Then you're going to end with a bird beak uh, situation and it'll be a problem. So always try to put the curve exactly at this area between the stent. Try to avoid the area with the thrombus and calcifications. If you have difficulty in visualizing the aortic arch because your C-arm is not good, you don't have a hybrid room, don't hesitate to put a wire in the like in subclavian or common carotid artery to see your, your, your landmark. The most important, you need to use a super stiff wire. You cannot compromise that, like land request or backup wire, especially in the trauma, because if you don't use a very super stiff wires and try to push the device through angulated neck, uh, angulated arch, especially in young people with a trauma, you may end with a rupture and patient die on the table. So you need a land request or backup wire. So what we do if we have to go to zone two, which covering left subclavian artery. Usually we need in about 10 to 50% of the cases. Left subclavian artery is very important for upper extremity perfusions. It's uh, very important for the posterior circulation because it gives the left vertebral artery. 
which is also important for spinal cord perfusion because we know that the anterior spinal uh, uh, artery give, uh, branch, uh, give, comes branch from the vertebral artery. Also, it's very important for the limb for coronary circulation if patient you need in the future bypass surgery. But in general, 90% of the cases you can cover, especially in the trauma, you can cover left subcaven artery without uh, consequences. So if you have to cover subclavian, what options? You can go with a chimney technique, it's very simple, or you can go with a periscope. Sometimes periscope is better because this way you keep your access for future intervention in the lower extremities. But if you do a chimney, you cannot have access to the lower extremity from the breaker artery. But the problem, you need a longer, uh, longer uh, uh, cover stand than if you do a chimney. The other option, you can do in situ fenestration, but if you do that, you are out of eye view, you are in your own, so you have to be very careful. And hopefully soon we'll have a branched uh, TVAR for the left subclavian artery. The other option is to use carotid subclavian bypass or transposition. Some people use it for all patients. Dr. Lapato has he mentioned that for all, if you cover subclavian or they do bypass. Some people do selectively and we go with that. If you have a patent limb to LAD, if patient has an upper extremity functioning dialysis axis, if he has a dominant left vertebral artery of the left, left vertebral artery coming off the arch. And we strongly recommend it to do a bypass if patient has extensive aortic coverage, you have to cover all the way down to the celiac artery to decrease the chance of paraplegia. Or in patient with a risk factor for paraplegia, like he has a prior triple A repair or internal iliac artery occluded. What the SVS guidelines saying for our covering left subclavian artery? If you do an elective TVAR, they said this should suggest it to do revascularizations. But if they think that current left subclavian artery is going to compromise the perfusion to critical, to critical organ, then it's recommended to do a bypass. If you're doing an urgent, uh, urgent TVAR, then don't worry, go and do your TVAR. And then after that, you can do bypass or leave it without revascularization. So it depends on the situation of the TVAR you're doing now. What if you have to move to, to zone one? Zone one, which is covering left common carotid artery. At this point, again, you can do two chimney here, but the problem, the more you increase the chimney, this will compromise your ceiling zone. The reason why some people like to do just one chimney and do carotid subclavian bypass, or you can do carotid, carotid bypass or transpositions. What happens if by mistake, by inadvert uh, coverage of left common carotid artery during the regular TVA? You're not planning, but it's happened. How you can avoid that by adjusting your C arm to be parallel to the left common carotid artery? If this happens, it's very simple. Just get to the left common carotid artery, put a wire, retrograde, go all the way to the arch, do angioplasty, and most of it you need to put a stent to push the device away from the origin of the left common carotid artery. Sometimes if you don't have this technique or you are not have access to endovascular for some reason, then you always you can do carotid carotid bypass, really need to convert it to the open. What about putting back a device? You can do that, but you have to be very careful because the T-bar has no hook. It has a bar, but no hook, but you have to be very careful, you have the gentle traction. You can, you can pull back for a couple of millimeters, but not more than that. But again, I will not advise it unless you have a good endovascular uh, skills and you're not dealing with a trauma because if you're dealing with a trauma, you can rupture the aorta. So you have to be careful with that. What if you have to go to the brachiocephalic artery, then you have to do a hybrid repair. You can put a big stent in the brachiocephalic artery and then bypasses, or you can go do a total debrushing of the arch. Like this patient, he came to us with a large arch aneurysms and he's not uh, fit for chimneys. So, and he's not fit for open repair because this kind of patient like to do an open repair with them, but he was really has a lot of medical problems, not fit for open repair. So we did debranching from the ascending aorta to the brachiocephalic and left common carotid artery. And they do the T-bar, the same setting, and this is our bypass. And this one year follow up with complete exclusion of the aneurysm and open uh, the branches uh, bypass graft. The other option, you can do a chimney, but again, the more you do a chimney, the more you compromise your ceiling zone, unless you have a very long uh, uh, proximal ceiling zone, you need at least three to five centimeters if you have it. Uh, the reason why it's better always to decrease the number of the chimney by doing periscope or like bypass and just one chimney. And again, open repel still, I think the gold standard for arch aneurysm in the fit patients. 
The other thing is that we all think that T-bar is safe and stroke is very low. And this is really a paper from British Journal of uh, Surgery. They look at the cerebral embolization and silent cerebral infarction and uh, neurocognition decline during T-bar. And they found that by doing the MRI and transcutaneous uh, TCD, and they found that overall brain injury is about 80%. Clinical stroke is 13%, but the silent infarction is about 68%. And this affects the patient neurocognition on the long uh, term. And the most pathology usually reason for the stroke during the procedure could be an air embolism which is trapped between the uh, uh, folded of the graft. The reason why some people now as rotility, they flush with the CO2. Could be a thrombus or could be a particle or plaque from the aortic arch. And the same papers they look at by doing the TCD, they look at the HIP, which is high intensity transit signals. And they found really the most signals or embolization happened during contrast injection and during stent deployment. But even during the wire and catheter embolize, uh, uh, manipulation, you can get a hit. So you have to be very careful. So how we can prevent that? By avoiding the shaggy aorta, try to minimize uh, catheter and wire manipulations, try to hypnotize patient at least for ECT 250 to, to 350, some people, they do temporary occlusion of the left common carotid artery. We don't do that. Uh, some people, they're starting to use a SIP, which is a supraembolic protection. Again, we don't use it. I see it more people use it with a TAVI. And again, CO2 flushing now become more practical, really, to flush the air from around the graft. And this is the CEP devices, which are available. But again, we don't use it, and we have no experience. But I think maybe in the future, with more data coming to show us that the silence infarction is really higher than we expected, maybe it will become a routine in the futures. Uh, we move now to the distal landing zone. What if we have a problem with the distal landing zone? The distal landing zone, again, we measure outer to outer diameters. We need an oversize, again, 15 to 20%. Again, we need at least two centimeters. We look at the curvature and conformity of the aorta. Also, angulation, calcification, and location of the SMA and uh, uh, celiac artery. So, if we don't have a distal landing zone, what we use, our first option to go with a branched or fenestrated uh, T bar. The other option to go with a chimney and sandwich, and we have Dr. Lobato, he can talk about it. And we can do a deep branching or hybrid technique, or we can do an open repair. Uh, this is a uh, strain. This is a branch. We have no time to talk about it, but this is uh, usually our first option. It's available. The only problem, it takes a long time to get it, an expensive device. Uh, the only thing, if you decide to use a branch of instrated, you need to follow up these patients. I'll show you one of our patients that he came with a large stroke of the aortic aneurysms involving all the branches. And we get an excellent result. We're able to put four branches. Very nice result. One year follow up is beautiful. Then he lost for follow-up for some reason, he didn't come until three years. When he came three years, he has a back pain, we do a CT scan, and you can see fractured his celiac uh, cover uh, stent. The SMA stent came out completely from its origin, and he came with a huge endoleak. So what happened, we went there, we did an angiogram for celiac artery. This fracture was not causing an endoleak, but the main endoleak coming from the celiac branch came, uh, from SMA branch came out, we are able to go back to the SMA and put a cover stand and we sealed the uh, type three endolic. And patient did fine for two years really. After two years, he came back again with a back pain. When they repeat the CD scan, we found our SMA stents fine, but now the celiac stent came out. The, the extension, the branch came out from the origin and you can see the celiac stent came out completely with a huge endolic. Also, he has a leak from the renal stent we tried doing the vascular, we're not able because the stent was very far from the branch. So what happened at the end, we have to open him up, do the branch for the renal and celiac, and we, stand, we block the uh, origin of the branches, and we stop the endoleak, and patient did fine after that. So again, my advice is that if you need to do branch of instructed, you need to follow up this patient carefully because you get some problem with the branch in the futures. Chimney technique, again, Dr. Lapato was us here. I mean, he can talk about it. It's, I mean, it's a very nice technique. It is, you know, it's no time to go through the details, but it's one of the options if you need to do with the thoracobdominal aortic aneurysms. Hybrid procedure, it is more terrible procedure, less invasive than open. The complication is mortality is lower than open repair, and the neuro event usually is lowers. 
This is patient came us with lack of down aortic aneurysms again, and we planning to debranch him uh, from the iliac to go to the post renal and one to this maybe because iliac was occluded. Sometimes what we use, we call the sutureless anastomosis. We put a viaband inside our bypass graft, which make our bypass is much easier, especially with the renal artery. So what happened, we had this our bypass to the right renal, and then we go from the side and put a viaband inside the renal artery. So it become like a hybrid stent. This is the right, and this is the left renal. This is a viaband, this is our bypass graft, and this is bypass to the SMA. And this is our angiogram to the both renal and this completion angiogram with complete exclusion of the aneurysm patent or our debranching. Um, so now we finish with the distal landing zone. I will move to the fourth challenge with the axis vessels. The axis vessel, the iliac artery, because a large device, especially the T values, a very large device was 24, 26. Now we're getting, of course, with the lower profile devices, but the old one is very large devices. Uh, if the artery is very calcified or not, you can use a contractile iliac artery. You can use multiple dilators. You can do angioplasty or stenting if you have a localized. But if you have any doubt, the iliac artery is very narrow, is very bad, just don't hesitate to put a conduit. And if you use a conduit, you need at least 10 millimeter dichron uh, conduit. If you have tortuous iliac artery, you, can, you need a Landerquist wire to straighten up your tortuosity. You can put some hand pressure on the abdominal water to reduce the tortuosity or you can do a body wire technique or through and through wire technique to straight your iliac artery. What are the most complications? Of course, it can happen, especially with a large device, you get thrombosis, occlusion, dissection, ruptures. The main problem is a rupture. This is what we call it, uh, of course, iliac on a stick. And this happened really with the older devices. The most important, don't panic. The most important to keep your wire. As your wire is still in place, you're okay. Then go from contralateral side and put an occlusion aortic balloon and then put a cover stent if you have a good landing zone proximal and distal. And don't worry about covering internal iliac artery. But for some reason, you don't have a good, you don't have cover stent, you don't have good landing zone, small quick flank incision, and you can fix it with the open repair. Then we move to the spinal cord ischemia. This is the fifth uh, uh, challenge, the cord ischemia during the TVAR. Some people, they do the routinely, they drain all the, you know, patient with the need a T-bar. Some people do selectively, especially if we have a long segment descending thoracic coverage, if we have to go all the way down to the uh, celiac, we prefer to do a uh, drainage. If patient has a prior triple air repair, if we cover left subclavian without bypass, or if his internal iliac artery are occluded. Of course, we do therapeutic if we patient develop any sign of numbness, tingling, or paralysis after surgery then we go and put the drain. Why we don't do it in every patient? Because also CSF drainage has its own complications. You can get a CSF leak with a headache or, or you can get a meningitis, you can get intracranial hemorrhage. We have one patient who developed a paraplasia because he developed hematoma around the spine from the spinal drainage, but luckily this recovered later on. So also CSF drainage has its own complications. If you, do use, if you decide to use CSF drainage, you have to follow up this protocol. It's very important. The most important to zero the spinal pressure at the level of the spine, because the nurses, they always, when they deal with the central line, always they go with the heart level. So you have to tell them to go to the spine level. You need to keep the spinal pressure less than 10. Don't drain more than 20 cc per hour. Otherwise, you may end with a subarachnoid hematoma or fatal brain stem herniation. If the CSF turn bloody at any time, turn it off. You need to keep the spinal drainage for 48 to 72 hours because sometimes you get a delayed paraplegia. So if you put it, don't remove it the next day, at least two or three days. And of course, avoid hypertension. Don't use any vasopressors. You can use alpha agent if your blood pressure is down because you need to keep your blood pressure up. If patient de develop a delayed neurological deficit, if patient, he did five surgery after two days, he developed a paraplegia. Then we call what called a COPS protocol. First, we look at the CSF. If we have a CSF, if we don't have a CSF, we go and put it right away. If we have a CSF drainage, we look at its function. If it's functioning fine or not. If it's not functioning, then we have to fix it. If it's functioning fine, we already have a drain, then put the patient flat and you need to drain it to less than five millimeters and try to keep the drain for seven days. Second, look at, look at the oxygenation delivery. You need to oxygen saturation more than 95% and keep the hemoglobin than 12 
and also you need to keep the mean blood pressure more than 90 and uh, uh, spinal cord perfusion pressure more than 80. So this is the usual protocol if patients develop a delay in neurological uh, deficit, called a COPS, uh, COPS protocol. Endolic, of course, I'm not going to go through that. We have a five type of endolic. We are very familiar with it. I'm not, go, I'm not going to go through it. But the only thing I want to mention is that recently we start using a helifix or endo anchors to treat some type one endolic. Like this patient, he came with the late type one endolic here from, uh, so when they're both couple in, uh, endo anchors, uh, we get good seal and this is follow up CAT scan, very nice. Uh, another patient, he came with a rupture really through abdominal aortic aneurysms. And the problem is that he has a very short landing zone. SMA is here. We only have 12 millimeters. And he has multiple surgeries before. He has like a large bacteric pseudocyst. He has multiple surgery. He has very hostile abdomen. And this is a container ruptures. So what happened, we went there also as an Hello, can you hear me? I'm still on? Yes, you are. Yes, go on. Okay, please. okay sorry. So the choice of the preferred technique depends on the experience, availability, and urgency. But I always feel that if patient is fit, young patient, he has no unfair, and he has unfavorable anatomy, I still think open repair is the way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sam. It was very nice and uh, comprehensive talk was great, uh, but I think uh, for the sake of time, I will ask uh, one comment for, uh, uh, from Professor Atif Salam from United States. Professor Atif, do you have a comment for Samer? Uh, I, I enjoyed this uh, expansive uh, coverage of so many areas uh, and so many different techniques and different complications according to the type of technique that you are most familiar with. Uh, in the sake of time, I will just reduce my questions. Uh, first, in zone uh, zero, there has been, uh, uh, there has been reports of uh, type uh, type A uh, retrograde dissection because of the high pressure in this area and the hemodynamics of blood flow. And some people are now doing hybrid in this area if needed and if the patient can tolerate uh, open thoracotomy to replace the, uh, the um, ascending, uh, ascending aorta. Uh, I noticed that the speaker uh, uh, is an expert in, in in the chimney technique, and there's always this problem in uh, dealing with these cases when you have at least four techniques uh, to deal with the uh, with the main arch branches, and if you don't have enough volume, you have to stick, I guess, to one technique until you perfect it. I was interested in this very long graph from the subclavian, uh, left subclavian dangling in, uh, in the main graph and how it works. Uh, the speaker, do you have any experience with internal branches in the arch? Uh, do you have experience with penetration with laser? Uh, there has been some increased instance of uh, gutter branch with the chimney technique uh, in the arch. How do you deal with this? My last question is, with the T-bar, the distal end, uh, there has been reports of 
re-entry and failure of remodeling because of per persistence of perfusion of the uh, of the false lumen. Uh, do you believe in uh, uncover stenting distal uh, to the main uh, to the main graft? Does it help in this situation? But uh, this is a, a very interesting presentation. There's so many areas that were covered, and I would love to hear from the speaker about his response. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ate, for this question. There are many questions, but I tried to cover most of them. Uh, the first question I think you mentioned about type A, uh, type A dissection when you do deep branching of the aortic arch. And I think uh, this is very good question, very valid questions, you know. And always we look our, we look, we really study our uh, CAT scan very well. We look at the ascending award if it's healthy or not. We notice that most dissection happens with technical problems, you know. So if you have a, like any like disease ascending award, we try not to do that, you know. And second thing, when you sutures also, it, 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 uh, you know, it play a major role to prevent the type A dissections. I mean, all this patient, our first option, always an open repair. But for some reason, if they cannot tolerate to be on cardiopulmonary bypass machine, then we do and uh, we do uh, deep branching. But yes, this is our back in our mind is a stroke and type A dissection. And again, most of the type A dissection with technical problems. So we try to be careful when we uh, do our deep branching from the ascending aorta. Uh, the inner branch, unfortunately, we don't have any experience because in Saudi, we cannot get any device unless FDA approved, even by FDA Saudi. So we can get an experimental device to try it here. So we have no experience. Uh, regarding the false lumen uh, with a dissection, yes, we try to uh, close the false lumen if we can. We have a different technique. Now try to go more with a, a stabilizing, stabilizing technique. Uh, so if we can close the false lumen, we prefer to do that. Using uncovered stent, we use it only in acute dissections because the septum is still soft. So we put uncovered stent, this can open it up and, and, and seal it. But if you have a chronic dissection, we found that using uncovered stent, this will not work. So uh, I hope I covered most of your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was great. And uh, I will. Uh, I will ask my co-moderator, Omar, uh, excuse me for the lack of time. Uh, we have to go to Mr. Murad Salam and uh, let's uh, promise our panelists and uh, attendees to keep on uh, questions and discussion on the VOT channel on the YouTube. It's open uh, three hours after uh, the meeting. We can uh, all go through and uh, continue our discussion. Uh, excuse me, Omar, uh, I have to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Murad Salam. He is a consultant vascular surgery at Guys and St. Thomas's NHS Trust United Kingdom, head of education and training in vascular surgery at uh, GSTT. Uh, currently, he is co-leading biggest treatment referral for aortic infection in the United Kingdom and uh, one of the biggest in Europe. Today, he is going to discuss uh, management of aortic infection. Please, uh, Mr. Salam. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and I will uh, just try to uh, kick start so that we can save time. I'm trying to share my screen now. I think the other the, the other one is still shared. So can we if we take that one I can share my screen. Yeah, no, it's all right. Yeah, sorry, let me see if I can do it from here. I'm off, I think. Uh, post share, here we are. Fine now. Uh, I think I think you just closed the presentation, but it's still sharing the background. Not really. So it resume sharing. Pause sharing, stop share. Here we are. Sorry. Yeah, yeah that's all right. Sorry. All right. Can you can you see that one now? Yes. Yes. 
Okay. Right. So, so um, uh, I've been asked to try to um, uh, cover a, a topic that uh, very close to my heart, and uh, and I think it's uh, usually uh, not as close to the hearts of uh, many surgeons. Um, and it's 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 um, as much as it is a relatively a rare pathology, as much as uh, we have got a lot to say about. I try to focus my talk on a um, little bit of broad. Uh, experiences and, and lessons learned from our experience at Guy's and St. Thomas's, but also put some technical tips and tricks that could be valuable. I have no disclosures related to that. Well, actually, I do have one disclosure, which is I am um, really um, uh, very interested in microbiology and I'm fascinated by microorganisms. And if I were to recommend to you one uh, very nice documentary to watch. I would recommend this one, which is talking about the um, strange uh, signs of decay. It's a BBC4 documentary, very interesting on how the microorganisms pretty much kind of recirculate all of the basic components of life. But moving on to our topic today, I will uh, try to cover aortic infections. And I know it's not really a very widely used term, uh, but I find it useful for the purpose of the uh, talk today to kind of broadly cover it because um, usually surgeons and organizations, healthcare organizations, see them and see a lot of overlap. They are probably at least two different entities. Aortic graft infections, and that could be an open or an endograft, and then infective aortitis, as, as some people call it, mycotic aneurysm or infected aneurysms uh, and pseudoaneurysms, uh, with all of the uh, discussions about the uh, terminology. Um, we, we, the, the story started, and, and, I, and I will just kind of um, take you back to 2013 at Guys and St. Thomas's, where we, we, at the end of 2013, we were managing a water graft infection as uh, many people were managing them uh, at the time. And, and as all centers, it was always one of those uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad, and then sometimes very bad. The results are not very promising, but luckily the cases are not very frequent. Um, my um, predecessors and my mentors uh, and the surgeons at Guy's and St. Thomas's were great surgeons, and it's a fantastic hospital. And, and we pretty much had all of what we should have to get good outcomes in that. But the pathology seems to be a very challenging pathology, and we all agree on that. And there are, there are, there's probably a long list of things that makes it very challenging. It's the patients usually with multiple comorbidities. They already um, uh, had an uh, aortic graft for some sort of pathology, and they come with all of the background uh, comorbidities. The delayed diagnosis and presentation that usually come with these cases where they have sepsis of unknown origin until they present with an enteric fistula or uh, with someone who's doing a CT and finding some evidence uh, uh, of a graft infection. And then the combination sometimes of two fatal pathologies, when you have sepsis and bleeding, uh, again in a enteric fistula or in a, in a nasty mycotic aneurysm. Moving on to the dynamic and evolving nature of these kind of pathologies with the microorganisms, even if patients start antibiotics, the antibiotics resistance that happens during the course of treatment and during the course of surgery makes it uh, even more challenging. And finally, uh, the limited literature guidelines, protocols of management uh, that is available and the lack of standardization uh, that makes it quite tricky. All of this is, is always there. But when you get to the bad reputation of how this disease is fatal, the dogmas of do this and do that without much evidence and some of the surgical myths that do not uh, do much to those patients, leave them well alone. You find it very difficult to really uh, um, start a full program focused on aortic infections. So we looked at our experience at Guy's and St. Thomas's, and this is actually one of, uh, one of um, Peter Taylor's work, if, if, uh, if you know him, is one of our uh, very famous UK uh, surgeons who retired. And, and uh, Peter Taylor looked at the uh, 14 years experience at Guy's and St. Thomas's of explants and reconstruction. And you can see that despite of probably a very good team and good practice, um, the results with explantation and extra anatomical bypasses were 
still not uh, very good. And, and it, it just kind of switched our minds that we probably need to try to do something slightly different. And from there, uh, we looked more into the data and we found that actually it's not that bad compared to the literature and the results are not fascinating anywhere, even in, even in Mayo Clinic and even in uh, other places who had a lot of interest early on uh, with the um, graft infections in general. And um, a reputation for that. Still, the, the early mortality was quite high uh, using different techniques of extra anatomic, anatomic cryopreserved. And then, and then moving on to what actually is the treatment of graft infection or, or aortic infection, you would find that the main treatment is, is sepsis control uh, and ideally eradication if possible. The rest and the, the other components are components to achieve sepsis control and eradication, but each one of them separately is a huge challenge. Diagnosis is not easy and not standardized. And when you get to it, um, in some cases, it's a little bit late. The surgical uh, procedure, whatever you choose, and the antimicrobial are both, uh, again, uh, full of challenges. One thing that, that is very special about, uh, not very special, I mean, it's probably with other pathologies, but it is uh, definitely very um, obvious when managing graft infection is the overlap between the different stages of the journey of the patient. So you don't sometimes get the full diagnosis from the beginning. You know it is infected, but you don't know the organism. You don't know if there is definitely a fistula or not. But you have to start the multidisciplinary planning and the operation while you're still ongoing with the diagnosis. And as you move on, you do, you do the operation if you're going to offer the patient an operation, but the MDT carries on further discussions so there's a lot of overlap between the different phases of uh, treatment here. And, and that's something that is quite uh, interesting about managing those cases is that you don't finish the diagnosis, move to planning, move to operation. There are definitely a bit of overlap. And starting off with the diagnosis, this is the diagnostic criteria uh, that was uh, published in 2016. And uh, it's... Um, pretty much what everyone does, clinical, radiological, and laboratory, but it is uh, using major and minor criteria and a scoring system. And it has been our standardized diagnostic criteria since 2014, actually, or 15, while it was in development. And since then, we've been using this particular diagnostic criteria. There are others that have um, published uh, similar or slightly different with the uh, scoring systems, but you can see that it's always a mix of clinical, radiological, and laboratory. And I don't want to go into the whole details of that, but you can uh, read the different things that you can see. The radiological ones are very strongly evidence-based and the laboratory ones as well. And then after a good diagnosis, and, and, and I have to say that early on, we, we call it suspected graft infection, and then we move on into confirmed graft infection only if we have tissue samples. We, we get the patients to and start to discuss in a multidisciplinary team. And, and this multidisciplinary team has evolved and became uh, wider as time uh, went on. So we have a dedicated team for that now, infectious diseases, uh, uh, intervention radiology, vascular surgery, care of the elderly. These are the equivalent to physicians who would look um, after vascular uh, um, patients. And then anesthetic and intensivist. We don't meet all together at the same time, but the core group, which is the top three, usually would meet to discuss every case. And then we would add on uh, the care of the elderly, input and the anesthetic. Um, the, the, I'm just going to go back on that one. The, the, the key to the multidisciplinary team with those cases that we found over time is the consistent and ongoing communication rather than just a decision and move on like many of the other pathologies we deal with in vascular. And then uh, for the treatment options, if I may quickly list the commonly used ones, I would say um, the aggressive one, which is the explantation and reconstruction uh, plus antimicrobials. Some people opt for uh, graft salvage techniques using drainage, debridement, omental wrap, uh, muscle flaps, uh, antimicrobial beads and antimicrobial uh, uh, soaked um, um, uh, products. 
And then um, there is another uh, way, which is without any surgical intervention, mainly antimicrobial suppressive therapy, plus or minus in case of bleed, endovascular intervention, just for the purpose of bleed and not for the uh, infection. And finally, there's always a choice of to do uh, uh, nothing and palliate the patient. We, we, we will discuss for the purpose of today uh, what we have tried to really uh, focus on in the last few years, which is to try to offer everyone who is um, um, fit enough an explantation with anatomical uh, reconstruction using a biological graft. And I'm going to go through that very uh, um, quickly. This is the ultimate goal. Uh, for the operation. It's excision of all infected synthetic material, debridement of the infected necrotic tissue, drainage of any collection, tissue sampling, good quality and multiple, source control, if there is an aortoenteric or um, uh, aortobronchial fistula, arterial reconstruction and organ revascularization if it's a visceral segment or an arch. And all of this list is the ultimate goal. Clearly you make compromises sometimes, but you need to try to do them uh, or plan to do them with minimal complications and collateral damage. Uh, I, I would definitely put a lot of emphasis on planning. And, uh, and, uh, and, I, and when I say um, emphasis on planning here, I mean, I mean the planning of the surgery is one part. The damage control planning, which is basically while you're waiting to do the surgery, there should be a plan in place related to antibiotic, to bleeds, and to re-bleeds if it happens post-operative. So there have to be a ready-made damage control plan for the team. And the antimicrobial plan, which should be detailed as well, and then the medical optimization plan, which happens uh, pretty much before the operation, uh, but it can uh, continue a bit after in the rehabilitation phase. Uh, again, I'll focus on the surgical one, but, but, but if you would want to kind of do more of those cases, the other three parts of the planning are extremely essential. Uh, and that takes us to, to, to a, this very famous quote that uh, uh, everything should be made as uh, simple as possible, but not simpler. And, and one lesson we learned uh, with those cases is the more you invest in planning outside theater, uh, the more easier uh, the um, operative part becomes. I'm sure that applies to many of what we do now, but um, um, for open surgery, it's always been kind of uh, uh, less important to do super detailed planning, but I find it in the graft infection and uh, explants a very essential part. I, I mean, it takes in planning pretty much like a fenestrated graft. And then you go on to some key points in planning. I think the first one is the right team and the right time. Uh, and um, then the use of all of the available imaging, the CT to give you all of the collections, the anatomy, as we all know, the PET scan to show you where are the hot spots that has the maximum infection load and the ultrasound uh, we use sometimes more to detect collection and of course to um, scan the deep veins that we use for reconstruction. Um, the approach, control and conduit, the potential risks and complications, the bailout, MDT discussion, what if, what if, what if, and I would say we, 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 we try to go to a plan B and a plan C uh, uh, already in our minds in case things don't go uh, well intraoperative. And then you, you need to keep in mind there might be a second operation, so, so you need to design the incisions uh, as if you might come back and need to uh, redo, redo, and do an AXFEM or explant uh, uh, part of the uh, remaining grafts uh, that was inside. And then that needs to be communicated very well to the team and, and the team briefing component we've done repeatedly for probably two or three years until it's become more of a, a routine job. Uh, uh, but still uh, you need a case by case briefing. And that's an overall, again, similar uh, way of thinking in terms of approach control, graft excision, as a, uh, and then the arterial reconstruction. And you can see again, they do intersect a little bit and they do overlap, but I try to Keep it in my mind that these are the phases of the operation. There is a phase to get there. There is a phase to do the control properly. And there's a phase to take the graft out and then to put another one. And, and thinking of the approach, you, depending on where exactly you're going to be explanting, you can, you can design your incision. Uh, one of the incisions I found from talking about this topic in, in other areas in, in multiple places is that people underuse actually rooftop incisions. 
which is quite handy in the, in the um, uh, incidence of graft infection because it gives you very good access to the bowel, but you can do visceral rotation, uh, uh, medial visceral rotation and have access to the supraceliac aorta and do like a type four approach. So for, for those of you who don't use it frequently, I think it's very handy for those cases. The rest is pretty much standard. For the considerations in terms of the approach, always think of the clamp position, the access to drainage and debridement, the type of reconstruction planned, is it anatomical, extra anatomical, the chances of having a fistula and where is that fistula going to be, the access to the vessels and branches involved, particularly if it's celiac SMA or right renal, and uh, finally, future operations and stage, appro uh, st uh, stage procedures. Um, for the control, if I, if I would share with you, and I would like to hear if anyone has um, uh, some experience with that, if they uh, give me more tips on that, the more definitely the better. I think the top clamp has to be healthy aorta. And if you're not gonna make it there all the time, at least do it briefly until you explant grafts particularly if the grafts are endovascular grafts with hooks and suprarenal fixation. Think of two clamp levels and the uh, picture on the side showing a double clamp, one supraceliac, one suprarenal. Put the supraceliac, take the graft out, then stitch with the suprarenal only and allow the viscera to flow. The need for cardiopulmonary bypass, left heart usually, but you can go on circ arrest for some of those that you can't use a left heart. Uh, we do we try to minimize that because we don't use much the um, uh, blood from the suction in severe sepsis. Um, so we sometimes do a shunt bypass, although it's not common practice, but we would do an axe fem shunt bypass if it's a, a short microtic uh, with a stent to explant. The bottom clamp, always think of the iliac arteries that you can put balloon clamps if things are glued in the pelvis. Don't try too hard to find a clamp. You can put balloon clamps and, and that would be quite sufficient. Um, sorry, I moved that a bit. Yeah, and then finally, uh, the EVAR uh, stent graft. The type of the stent is crucial and understanding its barbs make life easier to explant it. On the cell saver side, we, we used initially to use it routine, but then we found that with the infection, recirculating that blood can give a bad septic hit. So we stopped using it and use product until once we had very bad bleeding and we thought we wished we had some blood in the cell saver. And now what we do is we collect the blood in the cell saver, but don't use it unless there is a crisis uh, uh, and we are desperate to use it. And then the graft explantation technique itself and the debridement, you try to take it all out. You, you watch the suprarena fixation and there are pretty much lectures on how to explant uh, uh, grafts for the infected ones. The problem is you shouldn't leave any fabric and ideally you shouldn't leave any part of the stent in and that what makes it a challenge. For endo leaks uh, uh, or other reasons for explant, it's slightly different. Do good, very good microbiology sampling, uh, do a very good mechanical washout and then drainage of the collection. The biological grafts that we use are all bench prepared and we use either deep veins or bovine pericardium uh, patches and we fashion from it uh, a graft or we can, we can do tube or bifurcated or branched or a composite. Uh, and then we use some adjuncts like fascia lata or omental wrap. You, you can see that we try to use minimal, if any, uh, 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 synthetic uh, material on that. And, and the technique is, is quite standard. I mean, there's no magic in the technique really. It's, it's just kind of having, setting the table and. Uh, uh, properly and then it's stitching continuous sutures. You, you, you would put some stay suture, you might need a bit of planning and the bench and you can see here I'm on the side uh, uh, while other people are carrying on with parts of the operation. Uh, uh, and this type of setup and what you do is, is, is kind of self-explanatory uh, on, on what you need to do. Uh, these, this is one of these slightly complex graphs that add a branch to uh, renal and SMA and it was composite because we didn't have enough vein and bovine was not very suitable for the torchosity. Uh, but I will show you that one later. Fascia lata, which has been advised by one of my um, very senior colleagues uh, uh, who told me that he, he, they used to use it instead of Teflon uh, when they didn't have it. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Harvest the fascia lata. It's very fiddly to put it at the top end instead of your Teflon, but it's... Um, uh, uh, very rewarding when you take the clamp off. Hemostatic and it just supports the top end. 
I have to say I'm, I'm now a bit more selective with the fascia lata, but I use it in uh, very scarred top ends uh, uh, with uh, flimsy veins. And these are, these are some of the uh, reconstructions and you can see how, how amazing the deep veins are. And I'm sure some of the uh, experienced panelists uh, uh, with us today have done these operations and seen it uh, before. And it's surprising how thin the wall of the vein is, but it ends up looking like a, uh, a native aorta almost. Um, and um, as we go on, you can see at the top kind of different uh, uh, types of graft. This is a bovine. We make a bifurcated out of it, and this is inside the body for an aorto aliac. Uh, this is actually someone with an occluded left aliac system who we designed an aorto uni aliac composite, but that goes all the way to the distal external aliac and a branch uh, here to the left renal uh, that was affected. So you can be quite flexible with what you design once you get a bit of more confidence and experience on the graphs. And these are the types of graphs, a variety of graphs that we've done. This is a homograph, that's standard cadaveric homograph, that they are usually very short. Uh, we use them on thoracic, uh, more than abdominal and thoracoabdominal, and we use them when it's only one. Uh, having said that, I don't do any ascendings and uh, proximal arch. Uh, we, I do with the cardiac, the distal arch and descending thoracic, and then the thoracoabdominal and abdominal. So my experience with the ascending is, is, uh, is uh, just from listening to my colleagues. The second one is a descending thoracic using a bovine tube, and that's the SMA, and that's the left renal. The celiac was occluded here. And then the third one is the pure deep vein reconstruction. And, and this is a thoracoabdominal case that will come later, uh, and we can talk about it. Um, source control, it is worth to say that fistulas can be as bad as this. For those who's not seen big fistulas before. This is a D4, luckily, uh, which is quite good. And because you can close the primary without a big hassle, and you can see the imprint on the graft uh, of the bile and understand how, how long this has been stuck to the graft. Um, and then the post-operative journey is, is quite a journey. And, and the, the lessons learned here are probably uh, not this list. It's the counseling of the patients beforehand, the counseling of the family and the team that coming back to theater is not a big problem uh, and it could be part of the operation and we need to be relatively aggressive if we know what's wrong uh, and the patient can take it because waiting too much with those patients with a problem is, is not a good idea. The ITU, the organ support, the rehabilitation program and the post-operative follow-up protocol would make massive difference to the overall outcome. And of course, I wouldn't underestimate the antimicrobial treatment. I, I, would, I would have liked to say that the surgical part is the part, but it is not. It is actually a big component, as big as the antimicrobial treatment. If that gets done badly or incomplete, all of the patients get, would get a secondary hemorrhage, or at least most of them. And these are a couple of cases that I, I wanted to kind of share with you, just to kind of... Um, uh, share some experiences, and they are quite challenging. I'm picking a couple of the challenging ones. This is a lady with a, who's 69 uh, uh, with an ovarian cancer, uh, previous radical resection and lymphadenectomy. Then she had radiotherapy and photon beam therapy. Then she was diagnosed with re query recurrence because of severe duodenal st um, stricture. And uh, they, they kind of were thinking that she will need a duodenal stent for palliation. And she had her duodenal stent and then responded very well to the uh, uh, cancer treatment. But unfortunately, the duodenal stent eroded in her aorta and she presented with an aortoenteric fistula and ended up with a graft inside her aorta. So she ended up with a stent in the duodenum, kissing a stent in the aorta uh, with a lot of infection around it. Presented with uh, sepsis and major bleed above the endovascular uh, aortic stent graft, uh, uh, which eroded again into the stent. But we ended up we ended up kind of after very lengthy discussion doing that operation. You can see here one stent is the duodenal, one is the aortic, and they are pretty much kissing with some uh, um, infection here and evidence of uh, twice upper GI bleed. So so we we the operation that was proposed is to take the duodenum out. Uh, D1 and D2 left behind, but D3 and D4 were excised with the stent, and you can see them here on the right-hand side, and replace the uh, juxtarenal aorta with a deep vein, 
which was a little bit irregular in her case, and then re-implant the left renal artery, uh, which what we have uh, ended up doing. Uh, she's done really well. She's lost the renal artery, uh, I think, four months down the line. She's had a very stormy post-operative uh, with a DVT in month three with a bit of chylothorax, but she ended up uh, going back to her baseline and sending us uh, pictures from holiday. So I would say she took probably a, a year journey uh, of, uh, of recovery and she was quite fit, but she, she's back to her baseline. Another gentleman who's 80, and, and that, the difficulty with that one was the decision really, and should we go, should we not? And he presented with a, with a mycotic aneurysm that was stented uh, 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 in a fashion of chimney and a thoracoabdominal type, type three equivalent as an emergency endovascular repair. But he slowly afterwards became very septic with endo leaks and, and massive sepsis and a stent that is lighting up. Not sure that's gonna uh, 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 work nicely, yeah it is. So you can see here that, that this is the descending thoracic and then he's got the chimney um, and the team opted for one SMA and one renal stent as chimneys, as you can see. And then uh, all the celiac was occluded again. And uh, then one snorkel coming from below to the other renal artery. So again, that was uh, quite a bit of an explant uh, and ended up with a thoracolaparotomy, a left heart bypass, and, uh, and uh, a custom-made graft that has branches with the main tube as bovine and with branches from, made from the deep veins to the SMA, right renal, left renal. Um, and as you see, that's the final outcome. The anastomosis higher up here is probably distal chest or mid chest. This is SMA, celiac is occluded. This is left renal and uh, right renal is not obvious in this picture. And it ends here at the bifurcation. Um, and, and this is another one with supraceliac mycotic who had again an attempt of a stent, uh, but that didn't go down very well. Uh, as soon as the antibiotics uh, were uh, the IV antibiotics were stopped, it flared up and he needed an explant of his fever. Uh, and as you can see, this is the initial pathology that was stented and ended up with uh, this, which is a tube bovine with the SMA and uh, left renal. Again, that was done uh, on bypass and he did really well. He died three and a half years uh, post-operative as this gentleman. Uh, and he's had multiple cancers before uh, he finally um, uh, died. So the, the, the question that always comes at this stage of, of the discussion is, is there a role for endovascular in aortic uh, uh, infections in general? I guess, I, guess, I guess the answer is absolutely. And I think without endovascular, we would have never moved forward as we have moved. Because the reality is endovascular offered us a fantastic bridging mechanism to separate the bleeding from infection. So now we can deal with the bleeding, get the patient better than deal with the infection. That wasn't a an option before and patients used to have them together and you either deal with them together or you leave them to die. The second option is relining of target vessels and stenting. You do the operation, you don't worry if you have a stenosis, you are not gonna need a redo surgery. You can always come back and stent uh, um, with bare stents if you're doubting there is still residual infection or later on uh, once they are cured from the infection with any type of stent. You can also uh, and do a proximal and distal control using balloon clamps, if you wish. And, and that's another useful technique. And finally, the definitive treatment for some of the patients who are frail, unfit, you can use stent grafts and put them on antibiotics with some very patchy results that ultimately fails within two years in <clears throat> graft infection. However, in mycotic aneurysm, there is a huge question uh, that, that, that definitely some of them can be cured with endovascular only, but the tricky bit is to pick uh, those ones. Uh, don't think we need to go through that. These are multiple uh, endovascular procedures done for mycotic, done for bridging, uh, uh, just before a definitive repair. And um, another one here done to salvage uh, a failing uh, graft and that got uh, again uh, re-explanted. Uh, and this is one in desperation for someone who's very unfit with an ejection fraction of 10, who we ended up stenting as snorkel and chimney, as you can see, for one SMA and one renal. He's a young man with cardiomyopathy, survived four years on antibiotics, but never reached an explant uh, position. 
uh, and this is a, one of the uh, papers that I, publications that I really like because it's one of those that really tells you that mycotic aneurysm, possibly some of them can be treated with endovascular antibiotic only, but certainly there's a very high rate of uh, them having a protracted infection and possibly failing uh, and dying from sepsis afterwards. So I guess we, we have to do some work around that. We have to be able to select uh, which ones uh, would get away with it with a graft. The current protocol that we use is uh, single microbial ones who are not very septic, who we start them on a specific, uh, an organism specific antibiotic. We stent them first and we see the response. And if they are very fit, uh, uh, we have low threshold to explant. If they are not, we would give them a one year at least of antibiotic and reassess with scanning. But we can talk about that at the end. A very wide variety of organisms that we have got. It's not the Salmonella in the textbook. It's pretty much everything. And, and, and it's interesting to see that, particularly in the mycotics, that the biofilm makers, and I'm trying to be a bit geeky here, like our infectious disease uh, uh, colleagues, uh, I learn from them, that the biofilm making organisms are, are very tricky. And these are the ones who do this they just replicate, they make a biofilm and they hide from the antibiotics and every now and then release a septic shower. Uh, and that makes it quite difficult to combat them or control them with antibiotics. Uh, we're not far from the end, but it's worth saying that the Awoto Intellect Fistula group is by far the worst group and we have doubled the mortality in that group compared to the non Awoto Intellect Fistula. They do have, they are always a polymicrobial and they do have fungal uh, 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 growth in most of them. And you can see that they are slightly different on what you find, those are with or without fistula. Uh, Nick Price, my colleague from Infection Diseases who's leading on that, uh, likes to play the game of uh, uh, betting uh, whether there's a fistula or not, if it's not, uh, if, without seeing the scan, based on the microbiology and the blood cultures. That's our standard protocol for antibiotic, and we start that as soon as we take the cultures uh, or as soon as the patient arrives to hospital. And we add things as per demand. And this is the current algorithm uh, uh, of management that we are using at the moment. And I have to say it's, it's, it's been a bit static with minimal changes recently, uh, but it has changed a lot in the first year or two when we started the program. And this is the uh, post-operative uh, follow-up protocol as well. And, uh, and, and what, we, what we kind of decision-making uh, guidance uh, with some exceptions. Uh, these are the thoracoabdominal results. I don't think they are fully updated, uh, but the thoracic and thoracoabdominal were 12 cases in this series. Uh, I guess the total now is, uh, is 50 explants with biological grafts. Uh, 12 of them is uh, thoracic and thoracoabdominal. Uh, and we, we have submitted the, um, uh, the uh, series to the um, SVS this year, but unfortunately the SVS got cancelled. Uh, so it will be... Um, uh, presented soon and uh, published soon. And, uh, and finally, for, for uh, some of you might, might know about that, but we have the prospective registry that is called MAGIC, which is the Management of Awarded Graft uh, um, uh, Collaboration. And it's a, it's a database that is aiming to prospectively collect any suspected graft infection. I have to say we've not done enough publicity for it outside the UK and Europe. I, I have some of the colleagues in, in the US who were interested initially, but with many of the obstacles and it's quite tedious, um, uh, they, have not, uh, they have not fully joined. Uh, and again, we are going to be hopefully by beginning 2021 publishing our uh, data from that, that includes conservative management, antibiotics only, uh, and it's gonna be a multi-center um, um, uh, registry uh, outcomes. Um, last but not least, I think, I think it's, it's, it's been always in the discussion and on my mind that there is a common challenge that is with low volume, high complexity procedures. And, and, and I find myself and many colleagues who work in uh, relatively big units uh, facing this dilemma. Should we do them? Should we not? How can we increase the volume and would it make a difference? How without increasing the volume, increase the experience? And I'm very pleased we've got some very senior colleagues on the panel who can give me their, their life experience of what's their thoughts about a low volume, high complexity. I have, I have a bit of an opinion on that, on, on, on how they should be kind of 
uh, uh, overall managed. But not surprisingly, the opinion is changing as you go on and as technology help you and as vascular surgery shape and subspecialty defines itself. The overall learning points that probably would apply to most of those is that aggregation of marginal gains in the overall strategy is a key. Revisiting standard techniques, the NACE procedure and the deep vein reconstruction is a very standard operation that was done in the 80s and 90s by the masters of vascular surgery. And, and, and it kind of slowly between died or became not popular because it's a eight, 10 hour operation, it breaks your back and then the patient might die. And, and, and the, the lack of popularity in most places was mainly based on the combination of bad outcome and difficult operation. We have approached it in a completely different way, strategically rather than technically. And I, and I have to say, we do it with a big team, we do it sequential and we've made changes that made the operation easier. So I think visiting the gold standard, even the options that is uh, less popular is not a bad idea. And uh, finally, the maximizing the value of the MDT is a key. If you have MDT, it's not only to put a line in the documentation or ask them one question over the phone. When you meet and discuss cases, you learn together and each one can contribute in the following case a little bit more. And, and, and the philosophical question of how much customization to each case and how much standardization and the right balance uh, to get it right for each pathology without overdoing uh, planning for every case and also without standardization for what should be a tailored uh, management protocol. Uh, this is the fantastic team and, and, and more than that, uh, and the people who work on, on that, um, on that um, service at Guys and St. Thomas's. And I'm um, very, very, very hopeful that the microbiology, antibiotics, maybe devices will change and help us and not make us need this very tedious, long, big hit operations to patients. And who knows, this is a five megabyte, uh, not uh, very far away. And each one of us has probably around 64 gigas in their pockets all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Salam. It was a very nice talk and it is a very huge experience. You are very courage and you have a very good team. Uh, also, for the sake of time, I will take one comment uh, and leave uh, the mic for Omar. Uh, I will ask uh, Mr. Rabia uh, from Chester, what's your experience in aortic infection? I'm sure I'm an everybody is a nightmare for, for all the vascular surgeons. Uh, I enjoyed the talk of uh, uh, Dr. Murad, actually, uh, he actually, uh, it was a challenge to cover the topic widely uh, in this uh, time and uh, to present his uh, operative experience. Um, uh, I agree with, uh, with his detailed uh, operative experience, but next time I will be actually uh, interested to listen to the successful uh, non-surgical technique or the success of the, uh, the uh, conservative management. Because the challenge actually for us is not to go for explantation. Uh, the, I agree with the stenting removal is actually uh, was uh, uh, the better than expected or more easier than expected. But the other option like the graft, we personally go for the superficial femoral vein. We work in different teams. The challenge is, is, is not only to um, uh, meet the failure of conservative management and to go for surgery or even the graft, the other uh, comorbidity, especially mesenteric ischemia, which is killing the patient, and paraplegia, which is killing the surgeon, because it's, it's not a right, it's not a good uh, situation in which we face paraplegic patient after all the plans and so on. The, the, the group of patients who survived uh, actually behaves well from the reinfection rate because we are using the biological graft uh, nowadays and different teams with different experience. However, uh, in conclusion, I believe that there should be centralization uh, nationally uh, for uh, two or three centers to get the experience because the, the cases who survive to go for surgery uh, are not many. 
uh, and to standardize the conservative management, which is still in dilemma. Diagnostic uh, in early cases is not conclusive in all of them, including all the, the specific uh, isotope, WBC, the perfusion scan and all of this, usually not conclusive. You are in a long uh, duration giving antibiotics and the inflammatory marker doesn't go down and then you go facing a complication on emergency basis. So it's, it's still, there is a lot of work to be done and uh, I really enjoy the, the, the experience. And still I need to know what the experience with paraplegic or mesenteric ischemia in his series. Thank you. Thank you, Hussain. Uh, do you like to comment, uh, Mr. Yeah. Morant? Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I totally agree that, uh, that we, we don't have the answer yet. We don't actually have the clever answer yet. Um, the, the main emphasis, if I would emphasize on, on, the, on the series, is that, as you said, the diagnosis is a key, and we've not established that as, as a scientific community in a, in a good enough way. The, the new recommendations and guidelines from uh, ESVS, from the European Society, has used magic, has used the uh, diagnostic criteria that I showed today as a guidance one, but you are right. I think we need to work more on that. The ones that manage conservatively, if you want my honest answer, if they are infected graft, 100% died within two years, 100, and we follow them very tightly. And that's the Peter Taylor 2014. If they were mycotic originally and got stented, that is different. And I think this is a very interesting, gr interesting group. So with the current my my antibiotics, or actually with the not that there is much change since 2014 series. Established graft infection, if the diagnosis is right and it is a graft infection, not a mycotic aneurysm that got stented with an antibiotic cover, I would say, I always counter the patient, you have two to three years at maximum with the best antibiotics if you are lucky. And, uh, and with that in mind, we've gone very aggressive that anyone who can have an operation will have it. We, one of the learning bits here was the window of opportunity. So you don't start antibiotics and if they are well, you don't explant. It's actually the opposite. You start antibiotic, if it's established infection with a fistula, once they are well, you explant. And we take them out and, and we fix the, um, the, the fistula as well. And, and I, I, I fully agree, we need to work nationally and internationally together to, to kind of um, uh, collaborate on this experience and, and, and make sure that we generate some science out of it. And um, I'm not sure that covers all of the, oh, mesenteric ischemia and paraplegia. So mesenteric ischemia, we have um, two cases of, one of them was a partial explant of a type uh, two endovascular repair, a full metal jacket subclavian to alia. And we did a partial only for multiple reasons, patients was not fit. And we did, um, the stent in the SMA was pulled out and it was quite deep inside the SMA we did an SMA bypass and he ended up with an SMA dissection, but that was not a complete uh, excision from the outset. And, and the patient has multiple other comorbidity. And then we've got a couple of renals, one got salvaged and one we deliberately decided that we will leave. Uh, we don't have any paraplegia. We have, sorry, we have one paraplegia out of the uh, series that will be published, which is 40 cases. And it was uh, for a thoracoabdominal type uh, three repair. Uh, uh, and ended up uh, paraplegic, um, and he's actually one of the two mortalities in the 12 thoracoabdominal. He died in seven months from multi-organ failure and depression and all sorts of things. So one paraplegia and one uh, 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 mesenteric ischemia, not in the series, but in the partial explants. That is great. Is we will, yes. So uh, please, uh, the mic is yours, Omar. Okay, uh, because of the sake of time, I will take a quick uh, comment or question from Professor Ahmed and Professor Atif and Professor Sam. Let us start to Professor Ahmed. What is, uh, do you like to have a comment or a question? Yes, sir, it's both actually. And uh, we're privileged to have, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Murad Salam, I enjoyed the presentation, but uh, the comment and question goes uh, equally to Professor Atif Salam. Um, of course, um, we are witnessing an era of an increasingly uh, performed uh, uh, EVAR procedures and decreasing uh, reliance on the open surgical repair of abdominal aortic aneurysms. The um, 
the marvelous and heroic uh, uh, open uh, surgical interventions for the infected drafts as pointed out by uh, Mr. Salem. Uh, needless to say, they, they need uh, a very skilled abdominal aortic surgery uh, guy. So our fellows now are not being as exposed as before to open surgical uh, aortic procedures. Uh, I think as educators and mentors, we have this uh, ethical and uh, probably professional obligation of taking care of them. Uh, just to give you a tiny clue, back home at Enchamps, uh, the average fellow uh, was exposed um, every month between the two uh, teaching hospitals to three to five aortic surgeries, open aortic surgeries, whether for occlusive or original disease. Now with the advent of EVAS increasing much, much more, even outside IFUs, it's the other way around. Now, every three or four months, he is involved in uh, uh, an open abdominal aortic surgery. Um, Michael Macaroon, just uh, 12, uh, two weeks ago um, in Sharing Cross, uh, uh, was uh, suggesting that um, open conversion of a failed uh, slash uh, infected a, 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 a VAR device could be the uh, coming training ground for our fellows. What's your perspective, uh, Professor Salem and Mr. Uh, Murad Salem? Uh, so let us start to Professor Atib Salem, our eminent, and then we'll take uh, Professor Murad Salem. Professor Atib. Mm, thank you, Professor Farouk. Uh, I enjoyed this, uh, the talk, it's well presented. I would like for Dr. Murad to move to Atlanta so I can send him my patients with advanced cancer and infected grafts, patients with compromised renal function, cardiac uh, problems, because our results in these patients, if we try complete correction, are not very good. When we teach this to the, our fellows, I tell them these cases is like a bullfight. You can choose to be the bull with one plan and you end up with the sword or be as flexible as the methadol. Have plan A, plan B, plan C. And I think you, you addressed that. I like the slide where you said uh, customization or fitting the, uh, the graft to the patient, not the other way around. Uh, this is, again, uh, you have to have centers who are experienced and well equipped to, uh, to develop more experience and follow up on these patients. Uh, for example, uh, there are patients where you have to just <clears throat> transect the aorta, close it and do X by fam. If the life expectancy for the patient is limited, and the uh, comorbidity is excessive, but still this is not a bad way to do. Uh, our experience with uh, cryopreserved grafts, it gets you out of an immediate problem, but the long-term follow-up, uh, they, they, they degenerate, they get infected. Uh, the, uh, using the new vascular the veins from the uh, thighs is a very good, it's a long operation, it has its morbidity, but when the patient can tolerate this, uh, this technique, usually the results are good. Thank you very much for a very educational presentation. Okay, your comment, uh, Professor Murad? Yeah, no, thank you very much. I, I, I think that, uh, that's a, a, a very fair comment, and I think I share, I share all of the... Um, um, feelings around them being very long and very tedious. And I mean, the, 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 the fact that, that it needs a full team, it, to me, is something that should not be compromised. And I don't think any specific individual surgeon should go and do those cases on their own. And, and I think one of the things that can really help the team to push the limit is that there is more than one surgeon in that team that is capable to do uh, pretty much every single step. So if you have two, two like that and you have another a very good senior fellow level or another new consultant 
I, I think that makes a good team to get through this big operation. The 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 um, the results are are probably um, very. I mean, they are better than what's in the literature, and that's why we're carrying on with what they're doing, what we're doing. But we tend to do less and less axfems. We are we are really leaving axfems to minimal, exactly to the group you you highlighted. Um, so, um, um, and thank you for the thank you for the comment. Okay, and the Professor Samer, uh, do you like to have a comment or a question? Uh, thank you, Dr. Morat. Really, we enjoyed your presentation. It looks you have a great experience. You know, we learned a lot from your presentation. Really appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, I don't take too much time because I'm running out of time. This one and one question, I think. Do you have an experience with the silver graph? Do you think it works in this situation or not? So, I, 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 my personal experience is N equal one. Uh, uh, but of course, I, I have asked so many colleagues uh, who use it routinely. Uh, um, the literature say that the silver and the rifampicin soaked are probably a bit better than a standard Dacron, but not to be compared neither to bovine or to vein uh, when it comes to putting it uh, instead of an infected graft. But that's the literature, that's not me. W would I use it or not? I might be inclined to uh, use it in a case where I'm uh, doing a primary mycotic open repair, rupture with patient unstable. But the reality is we can do now a bovine tube on the bench in probably around 25 minutes. So what I do is I call a colleague and tell them come over and one would do it on the bench while the other one is, is doing a graph. But by all means, I think it's definitely better than Dacron. I don't have a first hand. The person who has good series of them, there are two centers, one in Bern and one in Bordeaux who used a good series of the rifampicin soaked and the silver. And, and they reached the same conclusion in the literature that they would rather prefer biological, but there might be something here that is worth checking. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, yes. Do you like to add something, Samir? Okay. No, thank you very much. Okay, that was great. Uh, we'd like to have more of your lecture, Professor Murat Salam. Uh, it was very, very valuable. Uh, I'm still amazed how you selected uh, your special interest to be dealing with such a disease that we, most of the vascular surgeon I know, run away from. Uh, thank you very much. Eager to have more lecture, Professor Samir, Professor Atif Salam, sharing your experience in our platform. And thank you, Professor Ahmed, Professor Hussein, and the mic is back to you, uh, Professor Ayman Fakhri. Thank you, Omar. Thank you all. Uh, really, I enjoyed your company very much, and it was a very uh, interesting and interactive uh, session. It was a great, really. Uh, before we go, I would like to announce the result of uh, Dr. Atf Salem competition reward. Uh, as uh, we announced before, uh, we asked the uh, vascular family. Yes. We asked all the fellows uh, along the universe to submit uh, their abstracts, and uh, we received many abstracts. Uh, 22 of them were eligible for uh, the competition, and uh, the scientific committee uh, were Professor Antimiani, Professor Victor Canetta, Professor Abdul Azim, and Professor Raul Jindel. They chose six winners to go for the final uh, uh, competition as an oral presentation for uh, the next week. And the webinar meeting next uh, Friday, it will be at 6 p.m. And it will be meet the fellows, not meet the expert. Now we have to listen to our fellows and see what they are going to introduce. Uh, the six winners were uh, Proxidenis from Russia, uh, is Sanhuri Karim from Saudi Arabia, Luthra Loop from India, Laviv Chaini from Kazakhstan, uh, Nagib Suhail from Egypt, uh, Ziada Ayman from United Kingdom. We have fortunately six winners from six countries. This is great. Uh, and as you see, we have very fair uh, scientific committee. Uh, then uh, it's time to go. And before I go, I'd like to thank all speakers and, uh, and uh, panelists 
I, we all enjoyed your company. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Lupato, Professor, Professor Salam, and Professor uh, Samir Kusayir. Also, I'd like to thank Professor Ahmed, Professor Adf Salam, Professor Hassan Rabia, uh, uh, Professor Isam Osman, and uh, certainly Professor Antoniani. It was great uh, uh, for us to join you. And uh, also Professor Nicola Trozzi from Italy. It was uh, a real pleasure meeting you. And uh, promise we'll meet again next Friday. Please mark your calendar next Friday at 6 p.m. Cairo time. Let's meet the fellows. Goodbye and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.